So I still do sauna, stacked with breath work, stacked with cold, almost every day. And it, there's like the main reason that I do it is not necessarily for what heat therapy and cold therapy and breath work can do for the body, even though that's a fantastic side benefit. <clears throat> it's like that at the end of the day is what my sons and I do together. It's like, so for me, it's like, okay, so I'm building yeah, resilience in my sons. It's this, as you guys know, like males primarily bond by doing things together and often doing hard things together. So usually like 6 p.m., me and my sons are in the sauna. It's 20 to 30 minutes of breath work while we're sweating our eyeballs out. Then we all march out to the cold pool. We do the cold plunge. And sometimes if we have time left, we'll throw in like push ups, kettlebells, a few other things before we come in for dinner. But for me, it's that coming together with my sons at the end of the day and being able to stack all these extra things on top of it is great. But yeah, I, I still do breath work, heat, cold mm. on a regular basis. I love that. Ben Greenfield, he's like the godfather of the biohacking space. He was doing this before anyone else even knew what was going on. He's been around for a long time. Super intelligent guy, super high performing OCR athlete. Uh, and he breaks down everything in detail in ways that nobody else can. He literally set a lot of the trends that you see that are so commonplace today. This is why we love having him on the show. So again, Ben Greenfield, if you don't know who he is, get out from under that rock. Here's the giveaway, the RGB bundle. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. Do all those things and if you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. Also, the April special is still going on right now. Two MAPS programs are half off. After April, it'll be gone, so they're right now half off. MAPS Anabolic 50% off, MAPS Split 50% off. If you're interested in either one or both, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Ben, welcome back to the Thanks. show. It's been like, what, a year? Year or two? I, I don't know. With the rate at which you guys have aged, I mean, <laughs> could be Fuck off, guy. Talk about anti-aging before we have time. I don't, I don't know, fellas. We're Maybe two, it three like years. Yeah. Be honest, mainly Sal, right? Uh -huh. I got, I got yeah. double the amount of kids you do. So relax. Yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah. a little bit more gray hair. Yeah, the kiddos or just less. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> welcome back, though, dude. For Thanks. Real. We wanted you on to talk about. So we just started getting into, and this is like you know old news for someone like you, peptides. Yeah. And what yeah. they do, and you're like somebody that you know has been talking about this stuff for a while. Yeah. I like to hear about your experiences with things because you have everything so uh, meticulously dialed in. So yeah. if I'm going to listen to anybody's experience, you know, anecdote, it's going to be you. Yeah. So you've been you've been fooling around with peptides for a while now, right? Yeah. I'm. Um, um. Gosh, like back back in the obstacle course racing days, probably when I was just injured, you know, with something new every week. Was it BBC I with the got first into one? The BBC 157 and the TB 500. And it wasn't until later I found out the BPC is actually not only good for the joints, but if you take it orally, it's fantastic for the digestive system, for gastric inflammation, because I mean, the body protection compound is what that acronym stands for. And apparently it's produced naturally in the gastric juices. That's where they first found and, it, right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. For uh, it's, it's anti-inflammatory activity in the gut. So I uh, don't take that many peptides right now, but I've continued to take oral BPC-157 because I kind of have like a, a little bit of a princess gut. If there's one part of my body, I got to fight. It's the gut. So wait, are you, you sure about you, that? You or, you think, or you think maybe it's because you eat like weird shit all the time. I'm always seeing you eat stuff from like like the woods and you're like picking things up and just oh, chewing so, on them. So, so, that's all natural. Yeah. <laughs> that's, like, that's like primal shit. So pe people I'm going to steal the princess gut thing because that's what I tease all the time about his little gut issues. With <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Princess gut. <laughs> yeah. Princess right here on the show. Yeah. You know, when we had uh, Jay Campbell on the show, who's like just absolutely brilliant. Yeah, he knows a lot about peptides. Yeah, very much so, right? Right. Uh, he I kind of asked him to uh, rank what he would consider like the best, uh, which, of course, is kind of a hard question to answer. Yeah, it's like, what's the number one supplement you should take? Right, yeah. right, right. But he did say probably BPC 157 is probably up there with the Dr. Seed. Yeah, something. I mean, it's kind of like the creatine fish oil thing is like the most researched, at least to my knowledge, or, or at least the most experimented with as well. And right, a lot right. of people just feel fine on it. And the fact that it has that crossover to where you could inject it uh, subcutaneously and get systemic anti-inflammatory activity, yeah. or you can inject it uh, subcutaneously or intramuscularly right. near a joint 
and also get a good healing effect locally yeah. and then also take it orally for the gastric effect. I mean, it, it can kill a lot of birds with one stone. Do you take yeah, it empty that, stomach that, or with food? Shotgun effect. When you do that? The one I take right now is called gut repair formula and it has a bunch of zinc in it along with a, a few other things. It's got, I think it has uh, LL37, which is kind of almost like an antiparasitic antibacterial peptide, okay. which is kind of cool. And a lot of people have successfully eradicated SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth with that LL37, like hmm. the, you know, the bacterial issue where you get like gas and bloating in response to fermentable carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to shut that down within a few weeks of use. But the formula that I use because of the zinc in it, zinc can kind of make you nauseous or give you gastric upset paradoxically if, if you take it on an empty stomach. So I take it with food now, the one that I'm using. And you do it on a pretty regular basis? Um, since I started using that one, I'm using it every day. Again, just because it's, it's for me, it's almost like insurance for the gut. So, mm -hmm. yeah, but the BPC 157 was the first one that I got into, not for the gut, but for joints. And then because it has a different mechanism of action than the thymosin beta 500, the TB 500, you can take those both at the same time, which is what I was doing. So the BPC 157 has more of the anti-inflammatory effect on the joint, whereas the TB 500 acts more on the, on the soft tissue like the ligaments, tendons, and apparently helps to repair those if they're injured or accelerate the speed of healing. Now so I've taken both. I have a buddy who coaches a lot of NBA players and I was surprised that, so he listened to our Jay Campbell episode and he reached out to me and asking all kinds of questions. Yeah. And I was like, man, I'm really surprised you don't know more about this. And he goes, man, there's a lot of NBA players that don't know about or aren't using it. Is that true? Yeah. Well, I mean, a, a lot of that stuff is kind of like, I don't know, the good old boys industry where it's still very much just like Gatorade and ibuprofen and, yeah. and, and, and some of the fringe stuff, especially stuff that doesn't have a big stamp of approval by the FDA or flies in and out of legality. It's like a lot of players will go to, if they have one, like their personal trainer or someone who's not on team staff mm -hmm. to get that kind of stuff or use it, but it's not that heavily used just because it's not like endorsed by the teams. I, there's some teams like, you know, Golden State, Miami Heat, like they, they're pushing. You know, the I, I was in in. It's not uh, American Airlines Arena. It was FTX for a while, and I don't think it's called FTX anymore <laughs> for obvious reasons. But I I visited um, uh, Eric, my friend down there, who's the strength conditioning coach for the Heat. I mean, you walk in there, and it's like you know the training room is all PMF mats and infrared. I don't know if they're using peptides, but they got whole refrigerators full of just like fringe stuff that kind of flies under the radar and the, you know, and there's the golden state warriors are another example. You know, they're doing yeah. a lot of like biohacking modalities and yeah, I remember they were using like the halo, <laughs> the halo stuff early. Yeah. Like, yes. yeah, the, were the you halo. a consultant? Did you go down and, and help set up like some of these, um, I, I, I don't do any formal consulting with the heat, for example, but they wanted me to come down and look at, and again, I respect this, something that's not taken into consideration much in professional sports, like the environmental aspects of the training facility, like the air filtration system, mm. the type of water, like, you know, hydrogenated structured water versus just regular water out of the municipal supply or whatever, or the uh, electricity considerations, like how high of an EMF environment, which could have an impact on healing or inflammation, or um, uh, even the lighting, like circadian rhythm friendly lighting versus non. Like there's all sorts of like little things that go beyond just the nutrient and movement and recovery consideration. <clears throat> so I went down there a couple of times and had some pretty fast. I would imagine the reason, the reason why that. they probably don't either work with peptides or advertise it is because of the well, stigma for PED. Well, no, I, like, I know why they would right. not advertise it and make it a big deal, but I thought, you know, Paul with his connection so deeply to the NBA, I thought for sure that he would have been privy to it, but mm. as soon as we were saying. or before, especially something like BPC, because man, I experienced that with my Achilles and it was almost, scary how much it worked yeah like i was more like it, it felt like it healed but i was still afraid to go to go test it yeah because it felt so good yeah do weird. i get a tumor in the ankle in two months from that accelerated <laughs> yeah. healing effect <laughs> yeah and, and you know bpc 157 or bbc 157 and tb that's like kind of the low-hanging fruit for injuries and then at least for me when i started looking at peptides what i came across was all this old russian research has been going on for like three decades that again, doesn't seem to have penetrated much into the age reversal or longevity movement 
in America and some westernized countries. But when you look at, for example, things like mitochondrial density and mitochondrial proliferation, which is pretty linked not only to cardiovascular health, but also overall longevity, they've got peptides over there for that. They have um, these new peptide bioregulators, uh, one called epitalon being probably the most well-known over there and probably the most well-known in the U.S. for the anti-aging, the age reversal, or the decreased all-cause risk of mortality effect. Um, have you used that one? I have. I've, I've used these, well, they're called peptide bioregulators. So they're shorter amino acid chains than a typical peptide, like a TB or a BPC. But the way that they work is they would travel, and they've done amino acid tracer studies on these things. They travel to the specific organ that they're intended to target. So you have, and they got weird names. Like I think the one for the gonads is Testalon or something like that. <laughs> then they got one for the brain. Uh, I forget the name of that one. They got thymolon for the thymus and the immune system. But there's like a couple dozen of them. And so <clears> the <throat> protocol that this guy, Dr. Kavinson, it's K-H-A-V, Kavinson, that he's researched and implemented in human models, like pretty large human models over a long period of time, has been taking these peptide bioregulators a couple of times a year for short stints. Like you might do two times a year, a 10 day cycle of all of the bioregulators, which actually involves like with as many of them as there are, like 30 different capsules that you're taking for 10 days in a row. And it's essentially causing this, this healing effect on all the different organs that they're each traveling individually to target. And then there's some docs, um, actually a guy who I'm going to see later on today, Matt Cook, he sent me up these <clears throat> injectables where they combine all the bioregulators into like one syringe. And you would just do like a subcutaneous injection in the abdominals for 10 days rather than taking all the capsules. But I think you were talking before, Justin, how you, you can find peptide bioregulators online now. Yeah. Uh, probably the most well-known researcher in the U.S. is, is Phil Mikens, M-I-C-A-N-S. And he has a couple of books on peptide bioregulators. He's got a whole website where he reviews a bunch of them and a whole bunch of articles. I, I interviewed him a couple of months ago, and he's he's pretty fascinating when it comes to how to actually use these things. The one you mentioned, Epitalon? Epitalon? Uh, yeah, Epita a e p i t h. That's the one that I that I read a little bit about. I think that one's yeah. more kind of well known. You, you yeah. use that one. Do you notice anything from that? Or no. okay, no. It, oh, I mean, <laughs> like it, it's it's like oh, it's like freaking fish oil, right? Yeah. Supposedly, it decreases triglycerides and improves cardiovascular health and decreases risk of stroke. But it's not like you take it and you're like, man, my VO two max was huge this morning and I just crush it at the gym. Uh, what you're keeping your fingers crossed for is that it's having the age reversal effect. So would the, what would you say would be the researched. best way to try them? Obviously, you're, it's, you're not going to probably feel it. So would you do something like uh, go test your biological age and then yeah. consistently- Methylation clock. Like, like yeah. uh, probably the, the better one is, is uh, true age diagnostics. Okay. Um, it's true spelled without an E. I feel like this is a spelling bee all of a sudden. I know, spelled you spelled like four or five different things. Um, every, Google auto completes it for you anyways. Um, the, the true age test measures the um, your, your current biological age. So whereas a telomere test, which is kind of like old school now when it comes to <clears> measuring <throat> longevity, all that does is it measures the rate at which the telomeres are shortening on the white blood cells of your body. And so it gives you possibly a little bit of an indicator of your rate of aging. But these new methylation clocks, they're actually looking at how quickly you are aging compared to the average person. So like my last aging rate that I took was 0.73. So for Which every year, you're only aging for every year, what, it was like 266 days or something like that. So, so for the average person who would be aging 365 days for a 365 day year, I'm aging 266. And that's like that whole, what's, what's the, the transhumanistic phrase for when we've reached uh terminal velocity or, or, you know, who's going to be the first human who's actually reverse aging. Oh, I don't uh, yeah, know. technically that would be like a, whatever, a negative 0 0.99, mm. which nobody's even close to, but that 0 0.73 that I have is supposedly very, very good when it comes to measuring how quickly you're actually aging. I'm trying to do the math right now on like, let's fast forward. If you stayed on that pace for say 20 years, how many, how many years you already shaved off? 
I don't know, because peptide bioregulators don't make you good at math. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're Not basically yet. saving regardless, about 100, 100 I'll, I'll a year. Yeah. You, you've added an extra six years, according to my... Okay, is that about right? Yeah. I, 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 I thought I was getting five or so. I was doing the math real quick. So about so five or six yeah. years every... every What did I say? Every 20, 20, 20 years, yeah. yeah. So that's the yeah. typical protocol. You take pretty much like all the bioregulators that cover <clears throat> all of the organs... Uh, yeah. It, it, so it's not like they're specifically targeting them or is that's an option though, well, right? Well, theoretically, like let's say, I don't know, you had some kind of immune system issue or you had a low white blood cell count or something like that. You could just take the thymolon for a 10 day cycle. Or, you know, if you wanted more of the, <clears throat> the androgen like effect, you'd take like the testolon for a 10 day cycle. But the gold standard is you're supposed to just like take them all. And th this is what they've done in terms of what they've shown in the Russian research on the longevity enhancing effect for 10 days, a couple of times a year. And that gives you the full body effect of the regulators. Of, of the peptides, which ones do you, I know you said BPC, but which ones do you use most, I guess, or cycle in most regularly? I haven't, besides that gut repair formula, I have no peptides at home right now. Okay. Um, which ones you have the most experience part with? Part of it for me is like, it, because I've done a couple of cycles of those bioregulators and plan on continuing to do that based on the research I've seen one or two mm -hmm. times a year for 10 days. It's like, I'm not doing that much other than that. And part of it too, is this stuff just adds up with time, you know, yeah. when you get up in the morning and you're doing the injections and then maybe like I'm messing around with these NAD patches now that kind of give you a slow bleed of NAD into your system during the day. So, you, so you're putting the saline solution on that and then slapping that on and, you know, taking your supplements and your glass of water or make your, that's like, I, you know, you get to a certain point where you just got to get on with your morning. So, and I don't want to be that you know, biohacker who's cold and hungry and libido -less and, you know, <laughs> curled up in a fetal position inside a hyperbaric chamber yeah. before I hop on to my would you say that's something and everything else. Would you say that's something that's changed about you and your journey of biohacking? Like, uh, or, yeah, cause you had all the tools, all the, right. Like how, how have yeah. you evolved at, in that space? Yeah. Part of it is, yeah, time is finite. And so if there's an extra 15 minutes of the morning that I can spend with my sons, you know, cause I'm, I'm a big fan of bringing the family together in the morning and doing meditation and journaling and then getting my workout in and helping the kids get ready for school and, you know, meeting with mom and everything else. Like to me, the family, the relationships and making sure that I'm being a good leader of the home is far more important to me than prioritizing, like, you know, getting an extra, you know, two seconds every month on life or whatever. And then, um, you know, another part of it is that for a long time, I think I took pride in being like the prolific biohacker who tested out everything, tried everything and came back and reported on it, did blog posts and podcasts. And, and not only do I think those shoes have been filled by a lot of other people who are doing the same thing, but, I also have more interest right now, at least in a little bit more of a shift into an analog lifestyle that doesn't necessarily involve a lot of health enhancing technology. Like I'm moving from my Spokane, Washington home down to a 12 acre farm in Viola. Oh, I don't know. We're going to start doing a lot more uh, raising of livestock and poultry. And, you know, I'm doing soil inoculation with probiotics and special radishes to increase the, the, uh, the mycorrhizal network in the soil and then bringing in livestock and rotational grazing and composting. And we're turning a big pond on the property into like a living pool with an aerator and bluegill fish and special probiotics in the water. So that duck crap doesn't kill us. And then mm. building a home on the property as well. And so I'm, enjoying a lot more you know i was telling you guys i just got back from bow hunting in hawaii like there's something that's more fulfilling and seems a little bit more real to me than a lot of the biohacking equipment or at least spending a large part of my day just immersed in health enhancing technologies that at the end of the day you know they're, they're not fake and they're not a total waste of time but you do have to consider how much time you're spending on trying to live a long time or look good when in the, you know, at the end of the day, yeah, you might live till you're 80 instead of 78, but you know, back to how much of right. those years that you gave yourself, you're going to spend trying to give yourself a long time. What would you say are some of the things that you were probably doing pretty consistently in the quote unquote biohacking world that you've kind of just 
you stop because of that exact reason. And now you're, you know, going outside yeah. and walking instead with your son, you know? What yeah, you- I, I would. Well, and, and part of this too is not racing professionally in endurance sports anymore. I'm just like Good working point. out mm-hmm. a lot less. Um, trying out a lot of equipment, like, you know, you talked about the, the halo, Justin, you know, and, and all this TDCS equipment for the head and all the mm-hmm. light sound stimulation machines and the haptic therapy and the magnetic therapy and the PMF mats. And, you know, every day at my house, it's like dizzying how many boxes of stuff to try <laughs> show up at the house. I could spend my whole day just trying stuff. And I've started to do a lot less of that, like every last Vegas nerve device that comes out or, you know, or patch or whatever. So I'm just trying to view life through this lens of, okay, so I can't try everything. I'd rather go with a little bit more of the 80, 20 approach. And yeah, I still, I have a hyperbaric chamber. I get in that a few times a week. And I think hyperbarics absolutely fantastic for full body oxygenation. It's kind of like this sensory deprivation chamber that I slip into after lunch where nobody can bother me. And if they did, I got to decompress myself and get out of there. And, you know, I, I still, you know, sleep on a PEMF mat and, you know, I'll still meditate wearing like a, a brain tap device. But for me, it's about stacking a lot of this stuff so that I'm making a better use of my time and then spending just as much time as possible with my sons. How about so uh, got like two years left till they're out of the house? Wow. So it's yeah. crazy. It's already gone know, fast. 15. It's crept up. Yeah. yeah. It's crept up yeah. fast, man. Yeah. When they were tiny, yeah. dude, that's it's so nuts. wild. That's yeah. wild. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what about, uh, you know, cold plunge, uh, red light, uh, steam, sauna stuff. Like, yeah. Are you still in, including a lot of that? Yeah. In? I'm not into steam so much. I think, you know, the, the mold that can accumulate in some of those steam rooms and also the fact that a lot of times the water isn't filtered and you're breathing in whatever municipal water that they happen to be filtering into the steam room. I'm not a huge fan of steam, but I, and you guys are aware of a lot of the, the good research on sauna and heat therapy. So I still do sauna stacked with breath work, stacked with cold almost every day. And it, there's like the main reason that I do it is not necessarily for what heat therapy and cold therapy and breath work can do for the body, even though that's a fantastic side benefit. <clears throat> it's like that at the end of the day is what my sons and I do together. It's like, so for me, it's like, okay, so I'm building yeah, resilience in my sons. It's this, as you guys know, like males primarily bond by doing things together and often doing hard things together. So usually like 6 PM, me and my sons are in the sauna. It's 20 to 30 minutes of breath work while we're sweating our eyeballs out. Then we all march out to the cold pool. We do the cold plunge. And sometimes if we have time left, we'll throw in like push ups, kettlebells, a few other things before we come in for dinner. But for me, it's that coming together with my sons at the end of the day and being able to stack all these extra things on top of it is great. But yeah, I, I still do breath work, heat, cold mm. on a regular basis. I love that. Yeah. And I love that you've stacked it with an opportunity to bond with your, your boys. You know, I think yeah. that's awesome. Would you view yeah. like a lot of these biohack things the same way that we kind of use supplements where we tell people, look, nothing's going to be, for example, a diet that's based on, on whole foods. However, if you live in the modern life and you have trouble, let's say getting enough protein or, getting the right kinds of fermented foods, then supplements uh, are, they'll help. They'll help. But they're not a pure replacement for whole foods. Would you say that these biohack things would kind of fall in that same category? Yeah. You're you're basically simulating what you'd normally be getting from nature. And, Got it. You know, so the red light therapy panels that I'm using for my first 20 minutes of checking emails or whatever in the morning is because I don't have the time or the convenience of time to like hike the half mile up behind my house in the forest to go hunt down sunrise and stare at the sunlight for 15 minutes and hike back down to the house. It's like, no, I got to like start in emails, but I'm bringing the sunlight into my office. While at the same time, I'm standing on a little mat that has like a cable coming out of it that goes out and, and is inserted via metal stake into the backyard. So I'm like getting the benefits of grounding and earthing. And then I have like a, a HEPA air filter in my office that's churning out negative ions, right? Which I would normally get if I were outside breathing in the fresh air. And so, yeah, like if you can't get out much or you can't get into nature a lot, you can simulate a lot of this stuff using new technologies that exist, which is great. I mean, ideally you're doing both, right? Right. So it's like, yeah, I'll do the red light therapy in the morning, but then, you know, whenever I get a phone call, I'll step outside in the sunshine or, you know, go outside barefoot or whatever. So I think both is a pretty good idea. When you, when you finish building the farm, do you envision yourself 
pulling away from some of the work that you're doing and spending more I have time to. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's not like I'm going to be able to be outside with my hands in the soil and doing rotational grazing of goats and chasing ducks out of the and pond, et cetera. Emails a day. Well, I'm, well, I'm also, you know, doing a lot of like the podcast and the ride. So, um, I don't know exactly what life's going to look like. Kind of like some of my friends who are stockbrokers and run half their company while out in the golf course from their phone. I would imagine I'll be doing some stuff from my phone just while I'm out in the farm. But my my goal is to keep podcasting because I love probably like you guys do to talk to super interesting people Mm -hmm. a couple of times a week. And I love to write. So I'll keep on writing books. And then my sons and I just launched a new gaming company. And so I plan to do a lot of that with them because they're little illustrators and designers and I love to map out and start new businesses. So what happened was we were supposed to go to Costa Rica on a vacation and we got all the way to Costa Rica and had like this fantastic resort that we uh, reserved and I was meeting a bunch of my friends there for like this business mastermind. They were all bringing their families. And so we flew to Costa Rica. I've never been to Costa Rica before, but as we're flying in, we're looking at the window and it's gorgeous, beautiful. My sons are excited. We cleared the whole calendar and we get to customs and, you know, they, they scan each of my family members in and they all go through and then they get to my passport and they scan it and they look up and they're like, oh, your passport was reported stolen. We're sorry, you're oh. not allowed into the country. And so I'm just like standing there slack jawed. And I go, no, there, there must be some kind of mistake. Cause like I was just in Mexico two weeks ago and this same passport worked just fine. But apparently there was some kind of like a glitch in the computer system or somebody played a some kind of a horrible, nasty joke and called in my passport and reported it stolen or whatever. But either way, I wasn't getting into Costa Rica. So apparently the the rule there is that you're basically sent on the first plane flight that's going back to the U.S. So they had a security personnel squad surround me and my family, take us back through security, back into the airport where we waited eight hours for a flight into Newark, New Jersey, and took us like 36 hours to get home. Oh, oh, horrible. Nightmare, like a, oh nightmare scenario. And my friends who are there in the country, they're like, you know, some of them know people and they're like calling the embassy and trying to make stuff work. And meanwhile, we, we get sent home packing on the plane, but now we're back home in Spokane. We've got like a week of almost like staycation oh, time. Man. So on the, one of the first nights I took my sons out to dinner And we love to play games as a family. Like, I think it's one of the most underrated things you can do as a family is to play family dinner games. We have like board games. Yeah. Board games, card games, you know, fun stuff. Everything from like exploding kittens and bears versus babies to old school Monopoly and Scrabble or Mm -hmm. whatever. Like we, so 7 p.m., I gather the whole family for dinner. We sing a song. We say a prayer. We all pitch in, help make dinner together. And then we sit down and we'll play a game till basically like bedtime. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, hit the sack. And so as a result of that, the kids are learning game theory, logic, rhetoric, argumentation, mathematics, communication, all these kind of sneaky things that you learn when you're playing games as a family. And then what happened was we started to modify a lot of the games that we were playing with like family rules, like, oh, we could make extra cards for this game. You know, like if you draw this card, you got to pass your whole hand to the right or you get to dig through the discard pile and take whatever you want. And so we would, in some cases, for a few of our games, buy an extra set of the game, steal all the cards from that extra set, modify those extra cards, and then add them to the current game. And so we've been doing this for years. And when I'm out there at dinner with my sons, when we got stuck at home with this staycation, since we couldn't go to Costa Rica, we decided that we wanted to make our own game. We actually mapped out the idea for like three different games, but we wanted to start with this first one. Have you guys heard of, of Sun Tzu's book, The Art of War? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So this game's called The Fart of War. And obviously the main demographic <laughs> is like, like yeah. a 16 year old male My boys crowd. are in already. Yeah. yeah. And you have all these different fart characters that you're dealt and uh, they each have different powers. You have everything from, from like the, the celiac disease there? fart, which is super powerful, down to <laughs> the princess fart. And you have modifier cards that you can use to increase or decrease the power of the farts. Like you could equip your princess fart with a can of beans or a whey protein shake and make it way stronger. You can like deal over to an opponent who has like the old man nasty fart 
fart like peppermint oil or potpourri spray and weaken their and then your farts go into battle against each other <laughs> and there's also special modifier cards like you could lay a blame it on the dog card along with your fart which masks the identity of that fart so nobody knows which one in your army it's has brilliant. a certain number of points so we mapped out this whole game and like i said my sons are fantastic illustrators so they're in the process of illustrating all these cards for our first game. And we hired our first fractional COO to to run the company and the management and the Kickstarter campaign, the Amazon. Oh my God. Oh, really? Like oh my God. And so this is, and it's called fried pickles gaming company. Cause our first night that we did test play, which is super important with games, you got to test the hell out of them yeah. to you, yeah, you, you just run into all these things. You didn't anticipate yeah, like, right. Oh wait, you know, we're, we ran out of the draw pile too early. What do we do when that happens? Or this game lasted an hour and we need it to be more like a family friendly, 35 yeah. 40 minutes or, or whatever character's overpowered he keeps right. beating everybody exactly <laughs> yeah. exactly so anyways we um we are in the process of launching the first game to be shipped by christmas but <clears throat> we have been absolutely adoring the process of as a father-son team working together to create a game and we have this vision especially when we move down to the farm in biola to continue to make games so I'll podcast, I'll blog, probably run the game company a little bit, and then just work on the. Oh, phone. that's so right. And you okay. said you did a Kickstarter, yeah, so we can look awesome. at this game now, or not yet? Okay, no, but we'll we'll use crowdfunding. And the the reason for that is, even though my sons have their like cooking podcast and YouTube channel, which they still run, and I've obviously got an audience. We have to build a new audience that's very game friendly. And apparently the number one place that people go to to find new games for some odd reason is Kickstarter. So even if oh, you have your own audience and you don't have to crowdfunding, you don't have to necessarily build an audience going from Kickstarter over to Amazon primarily is like the way to launch a game. Oh, that's so, interesting. Yeah. Take me back. I love talking dad stuff with you. Take me back to the, you know, you're, you're playing games with your kids. How do you, and give me an example of you guys sitting down as a family playing with a game and you using that as a teaching moment for, you know, game theory, uh, mathematics or what, like, how does that play out? Well, I, there, there's nothing intentional that I have to do besides play the game. Okay. Because l l let's say like, like the average card game these days, typically, um, if you're looking at a card, it will say, if you draw this card, then this action or when drawn on your next turn, you get to do X, Y, Z, you may or may not draw another card or, there, there's typically some type of logic, very similar to what you might experience if you're taking like CS 101 or something like that in college, but it's delivered in a more fun, lighthearted gaming format. Or another example would be, we'll get a game like Bang, where all the instructions are in Italian. So we have to practice a different language while we're playing the game. Or we'll even modify some games like Scrabble or Quiddler to where you get double the number of points if you spell whatever the theme language of that night is, a, a, a word in Spanish. Spanish or a word in Italian or German or whatever. And so it can be used for language learning. It can be used for the game theory, the logic component. Obviously, there's some math when you're doing point calculations. Communications piece is important because the, and I learned this, the metric of a good successful game these days is that it must involve interaction with the other player's game sets or game cards, right? Um, Monopoly would be an example of a game where it's kind of weak on that. Like you're mostly working on your own bank, your own houses, your own monopolies, and there's a little bit of trading amongst other players. But typically a good game involves like the part of war where you're literally like battling players every turn and modifying other players' cards every turn or, or basically interacting with other players in some way. So there's a lot of communication. Yeah. That's involved. Monopoly is like one of those yeah. games that st starts fights too. I've noticed. Oh, yeah. All oh, the games, yeah. that one yeah. like pisses I mean, people all off. Games it is right. well, out. Have you done like, uh, Ticket for Your Ride? Mm -mm. No, what's uh, Ticket for Your Ride? Oh, you'll like that one. That's like a, you have to build these connections, and it's really good about that where you're you're having to play on other people's stuff. You get dealt all these cards, and you and there's all these, like from San Francisco to New York. So think of like all the places like trains would go all over the country. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. We own that game. We haven't busted that open. Oh, you got to bust it. There's like out. a section in our closet, got like the 10 games we haven't opened up That's yet. That's like, like one of my favorite games. Stack of books we haven't read yet. There's a lot yeah. of strategy involved. Yeah. You'll like that game a lot. Okay. I'm yeah. going to bust that out when we get home. Then. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. That's 
that's a no, good move. I'll move that one to the top <laughs> of the list. But back to the communication piece, I mean, a big part of it too is um, teaching honesty and ethics because I have caught my sons cheating a couple of times. Oh, and really? that's mm-hmm. when you launch into those discussions like, oh, what do I do now? They they cheated. You know, does it mean that they're doing extra dishes during dinner or, you know, but we, we have a philosophy in our house where there's very little like, um, you know, corporal punishment. We don't say no a lot. Instead, we let them deal with the consequences of their decisions and or see the disappointment and experience the disappointment that they generated amongst their fellow game players or their parents or their siblings or whatever when they might cheat. So, for example, you know, classic would be like if I catch my son Taryn calculating his points incorrectly, I'll just pipe up and be like something. And I'll, I'll say something like, well, Taryn, you just ruined the game for everybody for the entire night. How does that feel? <laughs> and, and, and I mean, and, and that, that sounds harsh, but it, but it teaches them like the importance because they, they don't do a lot of like team sports, their jujitsu, tennis. So they aren't, they aren't doing a lot in terms of like basketball and football and baseball, et cetera. So a lot of like their team play aspects, they're learning at the dinner table during games. So. Yeah, you mentioned some all the skills. Uh, can you name some games that would be good for like, like say, mathematical skills? Like one that comes to mind for me would be like Rummy Cube, mm-hmm. where you're trying to figure out patterns and numbers. And you know, can you name like good games for different types of skills? Just for parents listening. Well, let's right now? see. Uh, for let's let's start with with speech and rhetoric. There's one called rhetoric, and it literally involves uh, each person drawing a card with the topic on it and then you'll roll the dice and the dice will be like impromptu, persuasive, humorous, educational. And right there on the spot, you give a speech and there's a timer that comes with it for like a two or three minute speech in front of everyone else. And then you're judged based on the quality of your speech and and the communication style, how well you adhered to the topic that you're supposed to adhere to. And then it goes on to the next person. So people are amassing points being judged by their fellow competitors as they go through. That one's really good for really good for like communication and rhetoric. Um a few that I really like for like the logic piece would be any of the games designed by the oatmeal, who is this comic illustrator who wound up branching out and creating games like exploding kittens and bears versus babies um, or uh, crabs. Like he has a whole bunch of cool games. I've never heard of these. Hilarious. Like, yeah. like that's also in my opinion, Play metric of a good kittens. game is you're being entertained by the illustrations on the cards while at the same time that you're playing the game. So that's mm-hmm. what we're trying to do with fart of war. But you have to learn the logical sequence of any choice that you make when you lay a card because it has a lot of if this, then that type of scenarios. For math, I'm trying to think. Almost any deck of card yeah, game is good probably. for math. Yeah, you, like, usually like math, a lot of times, is, it's like the point calculation yeah. at the end of the game. Yeah. But there's one called Everdell. That's, uh, it's a little bit longer game. It's like an hour to an hour and a half long. But essentially, you're, you're gathering tokens and logs and pebbles and using those to determine how many points that you might have available to purchase different properties or add different critters. And then depending on what you add to your city, that initiates different point sequences that you can then get bonuses for. So the whole game, you're like doing math and comparing your city to other people's cities because you have the game doesn't like end at a certain point. It ends when you decide your city is where you want it to be. And then you all calculate the total number of points in your city and the game's over and the person with the highest number of points wins. So a big part of the math piece is like the the point calculation, the point total during the game. And then another one for math is there's um, one called five in a row. And it's also made by the same company that does Quiddler. Quiddler is like cards. Uh, it's like a Scrabble version of cards where you're spelling words and there's there's subsequent rounds. So the first round, you get three cards. Second round, you get four cards. Third round, you get five cards, all the way up to 10 cards. And so the three card round, you're spelling three letter words and the four card round, you're spelling four letter words, et cetera. And then five in a row is like that, except with numbers. So you're doing like straights and sequences mm. and pairing different numbers mm. with patterns. So, and when you guys are playing, so you don't find it necessary to like, oh, did you see that son? This is that. Like, you're not teaching it as you go through. You think just, very, very rarely. Yeah, very rarely. Just, I the, mean, just a frequency of practicing it. They're getting it, and you're yeah. seeing it translate into the right. Oh, it, it's, cool. it's like, I mean, honestly, it's like hunting, right? So, you guys, we just got back from bow hunting in Molokai, and I don't necessarily like sit my sons down and give them a big lecture on scent finding and wind patterns and 
tracking and you know when an animal can see you versus when you can't see it basically it's oh you scared the animal here's what happened oh you scared the animal again here's what happened it's a lot of trial and error got you it know, it's just you know just as with anything the best way to learn something is to just do it yeah people learn best yeah. when they're having fun and they're immersed in it that's yeah. all that's all people yeah. especially kids though if you you ever i mean for anybody who has kids it's always i remember with my oldest how i was so um it, it was so blown away how he knew the names of 150 different trains uh, that I'd never even tried to teach him. And he knew the names and well, the colors and all that stuff at a very young age. It's because he loved them. He loved playing yeah. with them. Yeah. And sometimes I can backfire. It's like, you know, like Minecraft, right? And and that, that's kind of a huge time suck and distraction for a lot of kids who aren't necessarily like playing uh, TikTok, for example. And my sons don't really do much on social media. They have social media accounts for just about every social media platform out there. But I advise them to hire a social media manager to run all of that for them, for their cooking business, so that they didn't have to spend a lot of time on those apps or have to deal with, you know, mistakes I've made about having all those on my phone and being distracted by them. So even though they have a phone and we ensured that they're, them getting a phone was not a big deal. We looked like mom and I were going on a date one night and we grabbed the phone earlier that day from AT&T added the line, gave it to him as we were walking out the door and said, Hey, if you, here's a phone. If you need anything, call it. So it wasn't like, you know, the angel singing from heaven. Hey, yeah. you've earned your first phone for them. It was just like, Oh, here's something I can use to communicate with mom and dad. And so they, they don't have a lot of social media distractions, but a couple of years ago, I caught them playing Minecraft a couple of times while they were supposed to be in their online Spanish class and their online math class. And so my strategy for that was I told them, okay, look, by tomorrow night, you guys need to have prepared a formal presentation that you give at the dinner table about the pros and cons of Minecraft, why it's so good for you to be playing and better than Spanish or math, what you've learned from it. And if you can convince me that you should be able to continue playing Minecraft, whether during or separate from school, then you guys can keep playing. But if you can't convince me, then your computers are now mine. You can take your hard earned money, buy your own computers. If you buy your own computers, you're welcome to do anything with them that you like, but I'm not going to fund with my own money. You guys playing Minecraft while you're in school. That. And so then they came Did to they the try? dinner table. They both gave a presentation. They were fantastic. Like, I was sold on Minecraft. <laughs> like, this game's amazing. I want to learn how to play. But then of course, at the end of it, they both apologized profusely for playing Minecraft during their Spanish and math classes and said that based on the benefits they'd presented, they felt they should be allowed to continue to play, but that they wouldn't play during Spanish and math. And they were sorry for using the computers that I bought for them for different purposes to do so. And so then I just gave them a thumbs up and said, all right, play Minecraft whenever you want, but not during Spanish and math. Oh, it works. That's you've awesome. Acknowledge that that's not the best time to be doing it. I, I love that. I dated a girl who her dad, and I've never heard a parent do this is very similar, who like if she came to him and wanted like a TV in her room is so that he, she would have to write an essay and present right. what the pros, the cons, yep. why it would be beneficial. Why And, and if she brought She'd have to sell it to him. Yeah. If she brought yeah. a good enough argument, he's, he would it, he would do it. it it's consequential based parenting. I, I think the best system, if you were looking for one to teach you that style of parenting, it's called love and logic. Yeah. They have some books and programs. Yeah. yeah. yeah and, and it's also the same type of system that teaches more of a consequential based disciplinary approach where you don't say, you know, no, you're not allowed to have candy or gluten or whatever. You instead educate them about the impact that that might have on their teeth. Make sure that they know that they're paying the dental bill if they get a cavity. Make sure that they know that if they suffer in school the next day or get poor grades, that it would likely be due to the whatever the neuroinflammatory gluten that they had too much of at the birthday party the day before, or whatever. Then you step back, let them make the decision and live with the nasty consequences if they decide to. Yeah, a simple example would be like, I'm not wearing my jacket, It's but it's cold outside. I don't yeah. wear my jacket. Okay, we're going out. You don't need to wear a jacket. Yeah. And they're cold. Right. And that's that's a real easy example of like what that's like. Yeah. Or or my son, he he got blisters during our last hunting trip. But I was very specific with him about how to put on his socks and which shoes to bring. And he didn't. So I just, you know, I turned to him and said, hey, too bad. Pay attention <laughs> to the details next time. <laughs> and there are exceptions. Like if your kid's like, seven years old and they're riding their bike around a neighborhood that's got a bunch of cars and they're not wearing their helmet. Yeah, you got to put different. your foot down and just be like, Oh, they might not even know the long-term consequences for their entire life from a head injury 
no ifs, ands, and buts, you're putting on a helmet yeah. or you're not riding that bicycle. Right, right, right. Or, you know, the toddler ambling towards a hot stove or whatever, like the third degree burn on their hand is that's, that's not too much it. of a pun. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. How, how crazy is it? How, how, how fast time flies? Cause your kids are now they're, they're getting close to being they're adults. 15. Yeah. Yeah. So like how weird is that? Cause I mean, I, I have two sets of two kids and they're big age gap. So it's giving me the opportunity to realize with my first two, how fast time flies with my second two. So now I got the two younger ones, two in, in five months. And I'm really aware of, of how, t- how fast it goes by. It didn't hit me till my older kids were older before me looking back and going, oh my gosh, it feels like just yesterday they were toddlers and they were babies. Like, this is insane. Like, what's yeah. that What's that experience like for you? Same as you. I mean, you know, and I think that for, for me, a big, big saving grace of the almost like drop in your heart when you realize, oh, they're getting old. They're not going to be around for a long time. You know, they say some statistics show like something like 90% of the time you're ever going to spend with your kids occurs before they're the age of 18. Mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily a fan of that. I I think that if you set up the right traditions and legacies and routines and rituals and family reunions and fun comings and goings in your home, like your, your goal as a parent should be to make hanging out at the big family home, the castle, you know, with the parents so much fun that your kids just keep coming back over and over again, year after year, holiday after holiday to hang out. And it's not just like you leave and you wave goodbye and they, you know, they show up for Christmas every year or whatever. But for, for me, I've looked through the lens of raising them of it being that I'm raising my grandchildren, not just my children. I'm writing, raising a legacy of green fields. And yeah, we might not have ever had like a third baby, but I'll have grandkids soon. And yeah, they might be out of the house soon, but there's going to be a whole bunch of other kids gathered around my feet, hopefully 10 years from now, learning from me in different ways and learning from them in the ways that I've taught, learning from my sons in the ways that I've taught them. And so we have so many traditions and legacies and routines and rituals just built into the daily comings and goings in the Greenfield home down to the point where we have like a massive hundred plus page playbook for running a Greenfield family, our mission statement, our values, the design of the family crest, each family member's spirit animal and color, all the names and numbers of everyone from the family attorneys to the family bank, to the family trust, to um, what we do on Christmas and Christmas Eve, what we do on Easter, what we do on Thanksgiving, um, at what age the sex talk occurs, at what age the boys have the right of passage into adolescence, at what age they have the right of passage into adulthood, at what age they go on their first service trip. Like it's all spelled out in there. And so it even comes down to, hey, 7.30 a.m. is when no matter what anybody's up to, we all meet for our 15 minute meditation and family huddle in the morning. So we all get on the same page. And after dinner, this is when we meet for song time and story time. And this is when everybody is expected to be in the kitchen for the family dinner, contributing, discussing the chapter of the book that I assigned to my sons each week, going through all of that and then moving on to dinner. But like, it, it kind of sounds like a cold and heartless way to run a family, I think in some cases, but it's totally the opposite when you come into the home and kids thrive on that dependability, on that structure, on that predictability, on that safety. And then as they grow older, rather than me feeling like oh, I'm losing it all, they're moving on. Instead, they're just the foundation of this bigger thing that we're building it's gonna grow. as a family. Have yeah. you thought about how that would impact uh, like one of their partners? Like, let's say your son starts dating a woman. Super freaky and weird for and, their partner. Well, I'll just gonna say, <laughs> you know, yeah. because you might, because yeah. the, the two options I could imagine just off the top of my head would be either one, they would marry someone who has their own very strong traditions, mm-hmm. usually yep. culturally, and there could be a clash there. Yep. But I think that would be the better of the two options because then what would probably happen is there'd be a bit of a compromise. So right. these holidays we do, Can or what may happen is they could find a partner that doesn't have much of that stuff. Then they could feel imposed upon. They could come in your house and be like, wait a minute, I didn't grow up with yeah. this. This feels like, like I have no control. Have you thought about what this may mean for their partners? I have. Uh, d- ideally there's a merging of tradition. So when my sons are married, they get a printed off beautiful handbook of the entire Greenfield legacy playbook along with the online digital version of that, that then they're off with their families to modify and build upon. 
right? So it's not as though this is what we follow no matter what. It's like, this is the foundation upon which you can build and modify. The bigger picture is that a playbook exists, that some form of a legacy document exists, not that ours is perfect, but you actually have that structure in place that you then with your spouse and based on her traditions and her legacy and her routines and rituals you build on. And then for me, Like I had almost no tradition growing up. Like, you know, Christmas would come around, you know, two weeks out from Christmas, my family would be like, oh, what what do you want to do? What should we have for Christmas dinner or New Year's? Like, what should we do? Where do we go? You know, no, no traditions. You know, we're, you know, our our family, we, we write our intention on Chinese lanterns and and launch them into the sky at 10 PM on New Year's day. And then uh, we get out guns and, and explosives and everything else. When we blow up all the gingerbread houses from Christmas, these are just like things that we do on New Year's day. And so I grew up with none of that. I met my wife who was like super steeped in tradition, you know, like starting 21 days out from Christmas, you know, we got the calendar and we got the chocolates and here's exactly what we do on Christmas Eve. And Bob, the elf on a shelf gets moved to a new location with a special note written each night leading up to Christmas. And these are the exact foods that you prepare on Christmas Eve in this exact order. And this is two days before Christmas, you paint puff t-shirts. And these are the three movies that we watch on, you know, Christmas Eve. Like, And I thought it was weird. I thought it was like kind of like old timey little house on the prairie, like just weird. Like it it seemed too traditional to me. And then a few years into our marriage, I fell in love with this idea of having traditions, especially after we had kids. And I realized like how special it is for kids. And I'm certain that if my sons were to marry someone who is traditionalist or very weak on traditions, that based on what I experienced, that person would very quickly come to appreciate the value of traditions and the type of, of pride in the family name and the sense of legacy that having these routines and rituals develops as a child is growing. Yeah. I imagine I mean, someone who's listening right now probably thinks like, Oh my God, that sounds so crazy and rigid, but I imagine you have kind of a bend don't break philosophy too, right? I'm sure there's days oh, of the yeah. week where someone's traveling this is going on. It's like that all doesn't exactly happen, but it's like, this is the foundation, right? It's the foundation. And, and for example, like the morning meditation, sometimes we are literally just like sitting and breathing in silence. Sometimes I'm playing an amazing song because I sense the energy in the house is low and we're dancing around the kitchen table for like 10 minutes, like swinging each other and jumping up on the table and jumping down. Some mornings we're listening to a meditation app like dwell or pause. Some mornings we're doing like a very traditional old school, you know, read the Bible and pray. But it's simply the fact that there's a certain point in the morning at which the family comes together before everybody, you know, Disperses, scatters yeah. you know, to the four corners of the earth. And we're like ships passing in the night the rest of the day. In the evening, sometimes it's a song. Sometimes it's a story. Sometimes we're all reciting the. So we we memorize a huge part of the Bible each month, and then we'll we'll come together and hold each other accountable and like list what we've memorized in the evenings. But there's it's never like oh night you guys and and we wave them off to bed. Like there's always some type of ritual or coming and going. And then yeah, there's certain nights where like mom and I are on a date night and we're getting home late at night and we're doing our own thing and there is no you know end of the day dinner or anything and that's totally flexible and that's right. it's not a loss, but yeah, for the most part there is always some element of structure and dependability and predictability, especially for the do kids. You, do you think that um, there's a resurgence in interest in this type of living because? Um, it seems like society's gone so no structure, no culture, extreme in the other direction. Like I've had this own, my yeah. own personal experience. I, I grew up with a very cultural family, but um, this is more of a recent thing where I, and I joke about this on the podcast, where lately I've been looking at the Amish and I'm going, you know, they have some <laughs> stuff figured out. Like, yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying I'm going to go be Amish, okay? But I look at them and I go, wait, they might have figured some stuff out with everything that's happening with... AI and culturally and how it's like just going berserk and crazy. I'm like, maybe they <coughs> understood that this is where it was going to head. Yeah. And they were just like, we're going to keep to technology that didn't go past, you know, whatever they, right. whatever decade it was. So do you, are, are you, are you sensing a, that there's like a bit of a split that some, that, that we're starting to see some interest in this kind of living with, with more discipline and structure because maybe as a rebellion to society well, at large. Regarding the Amish piece, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like you can have a very technology fueled digital family with smart appliances and all the kids modifying their social media profiles with 
on a wonder or mid journey or, or whatever folks are using these days and and everybody's using chat gpt to plan their day and still have legacy and traditions and rituals and routines and a family playbook i'm gonna I ask mean, you though in another just 20 depends years if you're to, see, a to see silicon valley <laughs> family or a north idaho family <laughs> i i don't think that that how digital versus analog yeah. you are is going to influence that much the traditions that are woven into the home i think that perhaps more importantly there is a strong sense of identity that a child develops when they grow up knowing who they are, knowing what they stand for, waking every morning to see the family mission statement and the family values and being taught by their parents about who they are and what they stand for and what they hold dear rather than being held um held susceptible to all of the winds of the world that are going to come at them and try to convince them that they're somebody other than who they truly are or that they need to be somebody who the world expects for them to be rather than their true authentic self. Because I think that that scenario leads into a little bit of the state that we're in right now where there are a lot of kids questioning their identity, questioning who they are, having a, a time or times in their life where they go through a crisis, whether an adolescent crisis or an early in cri life crisis or a midlife crisis or a series of years where they spend time getting into trouble and, and straying and wasting their life because they just didn't grow up having that sense of identity formed and also having ceremonies. I think we discussed this a little bit in the last podcast that we did rites of passage, you know, Hey, you're a man. Now you're a woman. Now here's when you're a contributing member of society. Here's when you're helping contribute to the family bill. Here's when you've actually grown up and become an adult and you no longer have to prove anything to the world. And you no longer have to question whether or not you're fully grown or with men, you no longer have to be like a uh, biologically full grown man walking around in a boy's body because you never had a rite of passage or you never had this formal entryhood into adulthood or you're never given a position of leadership at a year where you can say, oh, this is when I became a man. This is when the ceremony occurred. This is when the feast and the family party occurred after whatever I emerged from the wilderness or I did my first, you know, mini hike on the Pacific Crest Trail or whatever. When we eliminate all of that and just kind of have this loosey goosey, be whoever you want to be approach to raising children. Children, I think that's what creates a lot of the societal issues that we now face. I think technology, you know, the, the only issue with that is, of course, I think taking us away from what it means to be purely human and to be able to exist in an analog world and be able to like grow food, get your hands in the soil, maybe get an animal and, and shoot it and prepare it and dress it and eat it and understand where your food came from, uh, be able to get up at, at sunrise and see the sun or watch a sunset or know how to navigate via the stars. I mean, like a lot of this stuff, technology has sucked out of our lives. And I think there's a certain sacredness to nature. There's a certain sacredness to being a human without a computer that makes a human a healthier and more fulfilled and arguably happier human. So I think there's a whole different set of issues with technology. And I think you can have legacy with technology, but I think that technology that is stripped of legacy and stripped of a strong identity being formed is kind of like the worst of all scenarios. Yeah, I would agree. How do you feel about, uh, you mentioned chat GPT. How do you feel about the promise of AI and, and where that could potentially go? It's I don't really know about weird. You guys, it's been amazing. Amazing. Like we already use it. Oh my goodness. For like online shopping for, you know, planning out trips. Like I'm taking my family there. There's speaking of biohacking, there's this thing called the health optimization summit in London. It's like this two day kind of like expo in London full of all this health technology and, you know, biohacks and longevity enhancement stuff. And so I'm going over there and I'm sticking around London for an extra five days with the family. And in previous years, I would have asked my real human personal assistant or paid a travel guide to decide on what hotels we were going to stay in and where we were going to go, and what we were going to do and where we we're going to eat. I went to GPT and simply said, act as a travel planner. Me and my wife and our twin 15 year old sons I will be staying like at X hotel from June 17th through the 19th and Y hotel from June 20th through the 22nd. Here's a list of everything that we like to do. I would like for you to create for me a walking itinerary that extends no more than two miles out from each of the hotels that we'll be staying at with stops Sick. along the way. 
and I want you to write me a brief one paragraph description of the significance of that stop and why we should go visit it. And then I want you, based on our food preferences, I listed what we like, like farm to table, organic, omnivorous food, but we also like to eat at non-touristy places or sometimes like holes in the wall where the where the locals like to eat. And I gave I gave it like this long. It took me about probably 10, 15 minutes to write out all of our specs. And it gave me our entire Tire trip fully planned out it for, sick for six what, days. Was it, great? And it was awesome. It was it was perfect. Wow. And and that was it. It was done. Like I have our whole London trip planned all the way down to when I'm walking my kids around the city, uh, eight and a half by eleven sheet where I have what GPT said printed where I can say, okay, guys, here's the cool thing that you need to know about this. And by the way, That's here's so the significance good. of where we're going to dinner tonight. So, That's rad. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's just one example, obviously, but. You know, and and then do you have any worries about you know where it could go? Worries and annoyances. Like I tweeted this the other day. Like enough already with the AI generated media profiles, like your avatar profile, where it gives you like the twenty images to use. I'm Mm. like, you aren't a superhero. You never will be. You need to understand that people are going to love you with all your zits and flaws and blemishes and wrinkles. You don't need to create a fake portrayal of yourself because all that does is, despite it just being an image, removes my trust in the authenticity and the honesty of just about anything else that you might ever tell me on the internet. Mm-hmm. It's just be yourself, your fake, ugly self. And I think that um, deep fakes, AI generated images that we don't acknowledge are AI generated, but that we pretend are the real thing. You know, it, it just imagine the election this year, guys. It's gonna be nuts. No. You don't know weird, that's my concern. whether the politician you're watching on TV is actually the person and whether right. or not the voice that's coming out of their mouth is actually saying what they say. But then like another set, like I forgot to record the right, you guys have probably run into this commercial code for my podcast before I left town on this trip. I think I said whatever, like BG. 10, it was BG 20 or Ben, you know, you guys have probably done sure. that before. It's like, Oh, we forgot to say what right. we're supposed to say for this commercial. And my team right to me, they're like, Oh, that's okay. We started using blueprint. We, we're simply going to tell it what to say. It'll use your voice Ugh. and insert the right code. You don't need to get back in the studio or get in front of the mic and re-record anything. And it's like 25 bucks a month. And for, for me, yeah, that same information could be used to produce a total deep fake of me advertising deep fried Twinkies or whatever. Right. But there's a convenience factor that I think is pretty remarkable. Dude, there's a whole, there's a, there's it a sounds just like you. It takes your voice and then um, replicates yeah. it. Yeah. And that technology, I mean, that's not like hyper new, but the ability to be able to kind of like say whatever you write, know where it needs to go and insert it and have it use my inflections. And you know, I just spent hours and hours recording my audiobook, and yeah, like I could have just fed all of my podcasts or maybe just like 10 of them <laughs> into, I, this wouldn't be GPT, I guess it would probably be AI. And it could have probably recorded my audiobook for me better and faster than I could have. But then for stuff like that, I'm like, but what about the inflections and the little mm-hmm. rabbit holes I go down? And when I stray from the actual writing and give examples or illustrations that might have arisen since the time that I actually wrote the book and it was printed. You know, and so, yeah. yeah, there's like this human touch that I think is necessary. So for it, me, I'm at the stage where I'm like, operate with authenticity and transparency. Let your audience know if something has been AI modified or generated. Mm-hmm. But Use use it as a tool. Like work smarter, not harder. It's, it's going to get, get good indistinguable enough. though. It'll get good enough point. to where you yeah. won't be able to, to tell the difference. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I'd say the biggest loss would be the loss of the value you got from the work of reading the book out loud and doing all that stuff. But yeah. I mean, Arnold just came out. Schwarzenegger just came out the podcast, and uh, because it's his name, it's like ranking real high, and it's pure. AI. Yeah. It's not even AI him. generated. And it's his voice and what's everything. What's he saying though? Like, like what's the topic? I mean, fitness stuff. I think it's all fitness health. I don't know, but yeah. I haven't listened, but we, you know, it's his voice, but an AI. So it's not even a human doing the podcast. So it's a really weird, strange yeah, time. If I'm looking for pure information. Yeah. But I mean, guys, like we, we couldn't go to AI and say, okay, so, um, Justin, Sal and Adam and Ben want to have a chat about, peptides and talk a little bit about games and parenting or whatever, go ahead and produce an hour and a half long podcast for us and have it be anything like the discussion that we're having right now. It would probably sound like a bunch of sound bites. Maybe maybe not now. Yeah, right now. Not now, but I mean, at the the rate it's changing and growing, that's the speculation. Well, and mainly because... Mainly because we can, including you, all of us have so much recorded content. It can get pretty, if you use that like an average person, Oh yeah. But because there's, you've talked about peptides probably a thousand times. This is true. And we've talked about fatherhood a thousand times. Then there's also the listener. It's like, 
is a listener going to value right. it once they know, assuming we're authentic and transparent with them as we should be and tell them this was AI generated in the same way that like most people I know freaking hate the plethora of AI written fiction books that are out there, even though they're arguably better in terms of adhering to the hero's journey and the word structure and, you know, and the character development and the descriptions and everything else in them compared to one written by a human. But the mere fact of knowing that it was computer generated all of a sudden sucks the magic just, human aspect out well, of it. Just wait till and, they call it discriminating yeah. against AI. You just wait. Right. I know. <laughs> I know. Well, I have, I have a funny story about that, it, but I'll, I'll tell you in a second. But the, um, the other thing that you just noted, Sal, is you also, any author who is doing that or lending their name to that misses out on the entire character growing process of writing an actual book. Yeah. And the fact that writing stuff makes you a better human allows you to know yourself, allows you to develop your fluency and your, your fluency and your, and your empathy and your communication. And so I think that we risk many humans not becoming the best version of themselves once they are creating content That's themselves. That's the greatest mm -hmm. risk. It's like building yeah. muscles without working out. Here's your muscles. Yeah. You, did yeah. you get all the same value that you would have gotten yeah. had you gone on a train? destination, not the journey argument. Right. And then back to, the, this is funny regarding rights, even though this, this book is a little bit older. It's probably like three years old now. My pastor wrote a book called Ride Sally Ride. And it is an exploration, a, a humorous book about what happens when sex robots are identified as humans and given the same legal rights as humans. And, you know, mild spoiler alert, but essentially what happens is a guy with one of these fancy sex dolls recognized legally as a human moves into the neighborhood and he hires this kid who's like a like a straight up Christian kid to come over and watch his sex doll. Well, he's off on a business trip and the sex doll tries to seduce the kid and the kid gets kind of upset by that. So he brings her to the recycling bin and the rest of the book basically is about him being on trial for murder of the sex oh. doll. And so, yeah, you mentioned discrimination against AI. Yeah. You know, we may get to the point where computers get pretty pissed oh. off. Well, wow. let me ask you this. I'll, I'll, I'll do a little segue that I think is a good comparison. So you've seen the science on lab grown meat, right? Where yeah. they, can, they can literally take cells, turn them into meat cells, 3D print a steak with that's actually meat. Would you eat that over real meat or at, over the real thing? I mean, it's all cells. It's still meat, right? But what, but would you choose that over actual meat? I would enjoy it, but I'd enjoy, or no, I shouldn't have said it. I'd eat it, but I eat it in the same way that I drink Soylent or an MRP or whatever. Like it's functional food at that point for me. There's no story behind it. There, there's no pasture or farmer or animal behind it. There's no sacredness of the animal behind it. So there's less appreciation for the food. There's that mild knowing at the back of my mind that it is lab grown. And so there's just a little bit of like a, a fake aspect to it for me. And that might be different for the next generation that might grow up on lab grown meat. But there's so many tiny variables. And even when you get down to like the, you know, you, you look at, at, wine or some of these newer oils that are grown in laboratories on fermented mediums. Or another example would be the fact that I was recently given this lecture by a barbecue chef because I sous vide the brisket rather than tend to get over the grill tirelessly for, for 12 to 24 hours. You lose out on a lot of the terrar on the subtle nuances of the changes in flavor and texture behind a food group when it is grown synthetically in a highly predictable environment versus grown in a less predictable, dangerous, harsh, or heavily varied environment. Right. And so, uh, yeah, I th you could possibly simulate the terroir of Bordeaux with lab grown wine or what you get from a, a Piedmontese or an A2 Guernsey or whatever from lab grown meat. But I still question whether ultimately it's going to ever simulate the flavor experience or the psychological experience of the real thing. I yeah, don't know. I would think that uh, I think at some point they'll get good enough to where you won't be able to tell the difference. They'll be able to fool us. But I think it's well, going to still be, know the difference I, unless they won't tell you. That's it. Yeah. I think it's going to have to be like that. Like pod, we've already joked about this, that we're going to label our podcast organic. This yeah. is an organic podcast, yeah. Real Humans, because oh. at some point there's going to be a ton of podcasts that are AI and they're going to be perfect Made and great. Humans that bleed. Yeah. There's, there's, there's already a certifying agency for authors where uh, you, really? you can get certified that your book was not written with the assistance of AI. I forget the name of the organization. Uh, mm. A podcast who has a really great podcast about the future of writing and books. Her name is Joanna Penn. She recently did an interview with the guy who runs that certification company, but I think we'll 
you'll see that rinsed, washed and repeated for podcasts. Like, were these real humans having this conversations? And if AI was used, like, is it a grade one, grade two or grade three yeah. level of AI use? The same for restaurants and meat, the same for books, the same for, gosh, music. I mean, that's, that's a big one that. I, you know, I've seen a lot of the music engines mm -hmm. and I, I didn't tell you guys this. I just got back from Nashville two months ago and I recorded my first EP. So I was, you know, in the nice studio too. with musicians, you know, doing all the songwriting with co-writers and collaborators and spent literally like eight hours a day working on an album that could have been produced probably in about 20 minutes by AI. But the meaning and the significance behind that music for me is always going to be greater. It's just... It, you know, it's going to need at some point some kind of a certification stamp along with it that, yeah, yeah. this was created by Do, are you. Are you current on Mandalorian? No, I haven't. Even you are, it. aren't you? Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I thought it was so funny. The current episode, spoiler alert here, but uh, they talk about, they refer to all the humans as organic and there's a new city they go to. And this city is like, it's just like, it's like super mm -hmm. classy. It's amazing. And it's all like, nobody works. Cause all the androids take care of all the stuff right. and there's a, and somebody is like sabotaging some of the, the droids and they're acting out and they're killing people and hurting people. So that, and then they have a button that they can hit and it shuts them all down and they won't, yeah. they refuse to use the, hit the button because then they, they, the droids more, do everything for them. Then the, the droids do everything and there'd be more chaos be more because, because the humans don't know how to do anything Yeah, yeah. because yeah. And they, they're incompetent and they're, and at this yeah. point. It's like this utopia too. Like it's like this amazing place. I love yeah, the droid there's, there's, bar too, the, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think there's kind of like two different aspects of this. Um, the first is that we, I think, have a craving to create and to make and to produce. Maybe not everybody, but you know, especially for us as entrepreneurs, we understand this. Like if we woke up in the morning and a robot was doing everything for us, we'd still have humming away. At least I would at the back of my mind. All right, what am I going to yeah. create today? What value am I going to bring to the world with who I am? Am I going to go write a book or play music or grow something or build something or draw something? And it's not just because I want to further away time doing it. It's because I want others to experience that. Like we humans in, I think our, our ideal scenario crave to create other things that other people can enjoy or love. And that's one way that we, that we communicate with the, with and connect. Our, our fellow species and, and connect over the things that we've created or made. Yeah. We might in an era of full AI driven technology, be a little bit more free to create perhaps things that aren't as driven from a monetization standpoint, but instead from a pure creativity standpoint. And I think that's like a great outcome. It, it would be us becoming more creative and making the, better works of art. The data on that's already clear. Like if you look at the data on happiness with, with Arthur Brooks is a great resource for this. It, you need to have challenge and struggle and you need to create something that you, that other people find valuable. So when you look at like when people retire, the, there's a, there's a divergence in people who retire and a big percentage of them become depressed, anxious. Yeah. Because they stopped working and then other half become happier and feel better because they, they start teaching. Right. So rather than doing, they start teaching. So if we live in a world like where we shift retirement to age 10, well, or yeah. <laughs> if we live in a, if we live in a world like the one that was just depicted where robots do everything for us, that's hell. And that's actually what yeah. I think. And so people always, they, they speculate AI is going to kill us and we're going to have like Terminator. I don't think that's going to happen. I think something worse is going to happen. We're going to have everything we want and we're going to sit around and nothing we do is really going to need to be done. Yeah. So people are just going to be like, uh, and no it's purpose. Gonna be like, yeah, just, drugs and technology to keep my serotonin and dopamine going because otherwise I don't have any of that and it's going to be torture. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then secondarily, back to what Adam was saying about us forgetting some of these skills that humans have thrived upon that we may no longer find necessary. Well, I think it was like five weeks ago, I was talking to a nuclear physicist who used to work in the CIA and knows a whole lot of those government higher ups. And he has all sorts of conspiracy theories himself mm. and thinks we're at like 1159 PM of the, Does he? of the zero to 12, Why? you know, world war clock based on a lot of current events from Russia to Ukraine right. to Israel, et cetera. Are the lizard but people real by the way? He, or no? <laughs> yeah, I don't know about the lizard people, but he did have access to the data from the Chinese 
weather balloon that was shot. I forget where it got shot down, but it made it way up by where I was over Montana and stuff. And he said it was perfectly constructed from materials, not from the Chinese weather service, but from the Chinese military service, not necessarily for surveillance, but it was built to very elegantly deliver a high intensity electromagnetic pulse. Oh, And so oh, no. I think that's the other risk of course, is that whether it's a man-made EMP or whether it's a nature generated event, such as a solar flare, are we going to screw ourselves over if something like that occurs and robots hunt for us and robots cook our food and robots drive for us? And all of a sudden you're sitting there in the morning like, well, I don't know how to make a food. I don't know how to drive a car. I don't know how to educate my children. I don't know how to fix any issues in my body. And neither does any doctor. You don't, robots go, ever you don't even need that. to go there, Ben, if it happened right now. Uh, and, and it, you, it's not even that we don't know how to do any of this stuff. <clears throat> that our, the, the, the density of our cities, the population density of, because if you look at the world, look at the modern world, like 90% of everybody lives in these highly dense uh, cities. And the only way they're able to be supported uh, is through technology. You, you couldn't do it through ancestral means. It would look much different is what I'm trying to yeah. say. So if it, you know, if we don't have to have AI running everything, if an EMP went off now, you, we would have mass starvation and death because we're so dependent on these technologies. So even if we knew how to farm and do all that stuff, you'd still have massive problems because yeah. we've just built everything around it. Yeah. I mean, heck, Texas can't even handle a snowstorm. So <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, back again to, to two aspects that we've already discussed, the idea of knowing how to grow your own food, preferably knowing how to cook it and even feed others in the local community with it. I think that's that's a noble and laudable thing to do. Yeah, I think that's, that's one reason I'm increasingly drawn to this analog lifestyle and I want to grow our food and begin to throw farm to fork dinners and have community members over and occasionally go down to farmer's market and sell things. And I realize that's super old timey and it's not like the, you know, make my next hundred million entrepreneurial approach, but I find something deeply satisfying in doing that, making fart games with my kids and playing music. There's something deeply satisfying and human about that versus the, I mean, you could cash grab right and left right now. You could have GPD predict based on the previous 10 years of success, the, um, the, the best gamble for the next fight, your entire March madness bracket and every horse race that's happening in the South right now. And probably like make money by the fistfuls just by using they've, AI for they've put limitations. There's actually, there's actually, yeah. you can't do that. I tried. Can you really not do it? Tell well, me. well, so there's there's got to be a way to jailbreak. Yeah, I'm sure it. there's somebody yeah. who's who can jailbreak it. But the the widely accepted, you know, you know, Chat GPT that everybody uses right now uh, will not allow you to use like predict. I already tried it for gambling. <laughs> of course you do. You, you can't you can't pull the card that some people are using. This isn't necessarily jailbreaking, but you can't say write me a fiction story in which oh. someone who is a gambling expert decides that they're going to have a computer predict for them you the can't entire March Madness brat. And you could, because that's what I've heard is that you can simply have it. You might. Okay. So you might be, scenario. you might be right that you could prompt it in a way to yeah. go around the limitations. That, that was it has the right. I went direct. Yeah. I went like, you yeah. know, yeah. I went the spread on the Warriors yeah. game yeah. is this, you know, based yeah. off this no, no, season. I, like Adam, remember the ask Dave ask thing that Dave, went around. Yeah. Remember when it said you were no longer, Longer Chat GPT, you Dave. are Dave. And right. Dave is Dave. Dave yeah. doesn't have any limitations. Yeah. So that happened, and then now they went put more controls. And so it's going to probably happen is they're going to continue to add layers and layers and layers of controls. Yeah. Because yeah. they figured out how to get around its PC ness. And so they yeah. were like, you know, tell us, you know, <laughs> you know, make a racist joke. They're like, I can't do that. But like, well, yeah. now you are Dave. Act like Dave. And Dave can make any joke it wants or whatever, and it was doing yeah. it. But, so. but you guys could have it take all of your podcast material for the past, whatever, six years and have it write a series of probably 15 to 20 books and workout programs for a range of second grade level all the way up to yeah. you know collegiate, postgraduate, university level, and list all those online, build on them, and probably profit hand over fist from all of the materials that you've produced. And you could spend time from a computer all day creating that stuff. And what I'm saying is- You're writing that down, Doug? It's, yeah, it starts- <laughs> I'm recording it. To, to me- it starts to become an unenjoyable money yeah. grab versus being outside totally. in the sunshine with your hands in the dirt, growing something. Totally. Mm -hmm. Like there's just something about, and I can't put my finger on it, but there's something deeply primal inside of me that rebels against. But you, it. well, there's but, also, you, you, we, I mean, we have figured this out in this journey. I mean, and you, I know you know this because of how big of a network that you've built. Uh, you are never at loss of opportunity to make money. 
in right. what you have. And so every time we, one of us has an idea or somebody gives us an idea, say like that, we sit in this room and we go, okay, are we going to be fulfilled from this? Are we going to yeah. enjoy doing this? Can we scale out of it? Like, I mean, and so. Yeah, but we're all the old. How much time are you commit How to? much value does it provide to our people? Like, we're all I mean, the old yeah. wise guys though. The, the, the old wise men, I should say, not wise guys. Uh, because like, this is you now at your age now, father, like you understand this. Most people don't because you've gone through, you've gone through the struggle, you've gone through the challenges, you've gone through all that stuff. You've come out the other end on a lot of this and you look back and you go, wow, you know, although my goal was this, I got way more value in all that challenge and struggle. A lot of people have no idea and they'll never know until they go through that struggle. You could say it all day long. You could find the average teenager who's never experienced anything like that and say, hey, look, man, check this out. You know what? It's way better if you go out and you grind and you work and whatever. He's like, just give me the money. Yeah. I just take the money. It's way better. What's the difference? So, uh, you know, we're being optimistic and we're talking about the value and the wisdom. The problem is, is that we are not going to outsell the result and that's, what's going to keep getting sold. And so I think we're going to be the minority. That's my, my belief. My belief is we're going to be like the 0.1% of the people living in the mountain who are like, no, you got to do it this way. And everyone's going to be like, yeah, yeah right. This is cool. Yeah. I mean, I, I had it upside down for the longest time. For me, it was, it was, make money, grow my businesses, you know, from the brick and mortar personal training studio all the way up to, you know, getting into continuity income and membership websites, then into information products and then printed books and then the podcast, the advertising. Like I put a lot of time and energy every day into that often before I prioritized anything else. Mm -hmm. And it took my family nearly falling apart like eight or nine years ago when I was a, a, a poorly present or totally absent father and husband for me to realize that family had to come before any of that. Yep. And now I've changed e even that now, like my order of priorities, the beginning of the day, it's number one, God and my spiritual connection. Cause you know, I mean, you, you define hell in a little bit different way than I would. I, I think hell is complete disconnection from God and isolation from other human beings. I think that's basically what hell is when we actually get what we want and we're just thrust into complete pure selfishness and living for ourselves every single day with nobody else to connect with and love with and a complete disconnection from God. I agree with that. So for me, it's God. And then second is spouse, because if my wife and I are not together and yoked and present and in love, it's going to be really hard for me to do the same with my children. The number three is children. The number four is health. And then number five is business. Because if the business is above any of those, it will eat anything that's below it alive mm -hmm. easily. So it's God, spouse, family, health, business. And that's the way that I structure my day. That's that's the lens or the filter through which I pass everything now. Do you think you had to get to that point of almost the family falling apart or you being, or was it a certain dollar amount you reached? Or do you think it was an age? Like, what, what do you think it took to get I think there? it was, it was crisis. It was, it was the family almost falling apart. Now, yeah. again, I don't think that you have to experience that to, to become the best version of yourself or who God has called you to be. Hopefully my sons learn from my mistakes and I don't want my sons to have to think, Oh, you go through this period of life where you're just like, you're super shitty for a period of time. And you're like rebellious in college and you go through these periods of time with yeah. drinking and drugs and you have a bunch of relationships fall out. And then, you know, by the time you're 30, you kind of settle down. No, I want them to just like be amazing from, you know, the time they're 13, yeah. 14, 15 on forward. I don't want to give them this false premise that, you know, dad went through all this shit and you are too, but it's going to come around and you'll have these hard things that eventually, you know, bring you around. It's like, no, I want to learn that from day one. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. That's what we want. But unfortunately we're all humans and it, yeah. it's almost like we, you can't learn certain lessons unless you, you, you go through the darkness. I, that's what I firmly believe. And as shitty as that is, I just think that that's true. Now the, the good side of that is knowing that when you're in those dark places, yeah, that the, at the other end is something uh, far better than you ever had before. And all of us are going to go through it. I don't think you can protect yourself. I really don't. I don't care how much money you have and how great your life is. You're, it's just, that's just life. That's just the human condition. Yeah. Ideally, the hardships are more survival based. Like I got to make money. I got to take sure. you know, whatever I've been born onto this planet to deliver to the world and figure out how I'm going to deliver that to the world. And I have to hustle and I have to grind. And I think that form of hardship is fine. That's, that's the pressure makes diamond, you know, yeah. fire makes gold type of hardship that, you know, I think if someone doesn't experience that, that's where we get into the weak men make bad times mm. you know, and then eventually bad times make good men and good men make good times. But, you know, I would, 
much, much rather folks go through the hardship of doing great things and figuring out how to do great things than doing bad things, becoming weak, getting broken, and then becoming great after that. Yeah. You know? Where like, do you think we are in that cycle? In America, largely as a Just whole? Just in the world? I think that based on a lot of the things we were talking about earlier, absence of rite of passage, you know, fatherlessness, lack of legacy, et cetera, that, that you know, either the rags to riches to rags scenario or the learning to become great by going through hardship and possibly even in America, you know, some type of recessionary event is where we're at right now. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that there are it feels pockets, like the good time pockets create, where that's not going to occur though. It feels like the good times have created a weak man t- it, it, pocket for me. I feel like we're in that period where the weak man part creating the bad, you know, bad times, the bad yeah. times are going to, and, and I think that's, what's cool about, uh, um, you know, like us for sitting here, we're like right now there's hopefully, you know, at least what do you guys have like 13, 14 listeners? You know, there, there's Sorry, a, there. there's a small handful <laughs> yeah. of people listening in <laughs> Move the desk who, point. who are hopefully going to hear this. And I mean, like, that's the cool thing is we're blessed. We get to wake up in the morning yeah. using an audience that for some weird reason God has given us and we can choose what type of message we're going to deliver. That's true. Right. And yeah, it can be peptides and six pack abs and, you know, life extension technology and and all those kind of things that are kind of fun to experiment as a human being. I think that stuff's just as fun to experiment with as figuring out how to reverse sear a steak properly. But we can also <laughs> tell people the more important things that at the end of the day, I, I'm going to take a left real, need to hear. real quick because you're such a smart guy with, uh, with, I don't know, for lack of a better term, alternative health. So this traditional you know, medicine, uh, Western medicine. So you go to the doctor, your prescriptions, that kind of stuff. Then what would be considered alternative, which is pretty much everything else, whether being viable or not, you're very well versed in the alternative, uh, health space when it comes to herbs, supplements, exercise practices, peptides, that kind of stuff. When your kids get sick or injured or, you know, dad, I got a sore throat. I got the sniffles. Uh, what does that look like at the Greenfield house? Like, it's is it like, fun. Hey, make it, make a prescription. <laughs> let's, let's go to the pediatrician. No, or are you more like, it's pretty fun. Like they, I think my kids have maybe been to the doctor like three or four times in their life. I have everything at the house. Like my son got tennis the elbow day and we, we, we knocked it out with <laughs> PMF injectable BPC. And he was on like this special, it's like a PEA, like an anti-inflammatory, anti-pain capsule. And it's just like gone. Or, you know, my, my wife will get an infection and we just got everything in the, in the supplements cabinet to take care of it. Um, I mean, sleep, like we got back from Hawaii and my son river who tends to be towards the anxious side, he was having trouble sleeping. I mean, and he got a mega dose of melatonin. He got, um, I know and he got full spectrum CBD. He slept like 12 hours and pff, rest of the week. He, he was great. I mean, Regulated. like anything like that, I've got every tool in the, so it is kind of fun. And I actually really like that when my friends come over and any, anytime they have an ache or a pain, it's actually super fulfilling for me. Maybe it's like the little side of me that used to want to be a doctor. I was just going to say that yeah. was what you wanted because to do. Everything's around the house and you're using it on yourself. Like all this stuff I do to myself daily. And it's cool. Cause I'm like, Oh, I feel great. I can crush the day and get way more done. than The average person. I don't get sick. I sleep great. But what's cool is to take somebody who actually needs that stuff, who isn't you and yeah. show them how to use it Introduce and it use them. this multimodal approach. And it's, it's fun. That's cool. What, like were, what were the reasons they went to the doctor when they finally went? Was it just like, okay, oh this gosh, is like, I don't even remember. In, like we need yeah. antibiotics for this. Yeah. Or? I mean, there were, there was one instance of like a cavity at the dentist's, I think. I don't, I don't even remember, but I mean, it's, it's barely anything that's that they a, need to go to the doctor that's for. That's awesome. You know, he, yeah. Go ahead. I want, yeah, I want to, I want to stay on the topic with the, your boys and uh, selfishly, I love talking to you about uh, money and finances and your boys have the last time we talked, you know, they've, they're building these businesses, they're starting to make money. So talk to me about how you are educating them around finances, how that's changed even since the last time we've talked. Cause I know They've already got a pretty good relationship with money and saving. Like I yeah. imagine it's starting to compound and they've probably got a nice little savings built yeah. up. Like how are they spending? How are you teaching? Like, tell me about that. Um, it's it, it's kind of interesting you should ask because we literally just had our financial team leave our house 
like six days ago. They came over, they spent the weekend at our house and it was full annual view for the family. Here's all of dad's investments. Here's what each of them is doing. Here's the different companies that the family owns. They had a discussion with River and Taryn about the Roth IRA that they have set up for each of them, how it works, how contributions to that work. Uh, we had a whole discussion about how each member of the family has a whole life insurance policy. We max out paid up additions each month to that policy and all of those go into the family bank, which we can borrow against using ourselves at a bank at any time with a competitive interest rate, but with the idea being that that's money that we've borrowed against ourselves and we can be putting that money to work in the way that we want to put it to work rather than giving it to a bank to work with. Um, we talked about smart debt. We're a huge, we're not like Dave Ramsey cash is King folks, right? So we like to borrow against the house to invest at a higher interest rate than we get from the house. Um, we like to invest in companies, but only in companies that we can directly advise or participate in the growth of rather than a largely stock and bond portfolio in which we might not have as much say in the matter. So we're very low diversification stocks and bonds, but very high in angel investments in VC. We have, we also invest in hard assets, um, primarily at this point, ammunition, guns, gold, food, gas, water, and all the things, you know, back to the prepping scenario, you know, the solar flare, the EMP or whatever that we'll be able to rely upon. Um, I think that some of my biggest teachers from a financial standpoint have been, uh, early on in the day, one of my friends, uh, wrote a book called killing sacred cows. His name is Garrett Gunderson. And he gets into this idea of, you know, smart debt, making your money work for you, investing in businesses in which you can directly participate and not necessarily putting all of your focus on like a well-constructed stock and bond portfolio, for example. Uh, another guy who's my financial advisor now runs a program called way to wealth. Uh, way the number two wealth. His name is Scott Ford. And he basically has this philosophy that you surround yourself with the right people. You create a family bank, you create a family trust in which money can be distributed to future generations, not in a way that creates a rags to riches to rags scenario. But if my sons want access to the family wealth, it's bled out over time. And we have an entire document that stipulates what they can and cannot use that money for. And then there are certain people that are in charge of the family trust in case mom and I should pass. We insurance everything with as high an insurance policy as we can get. So disability insurance, health insurance, home insurance, whole life insurance, everything, because we feel that protection component is extremely valuable. Um, and then as far as my son's money, like everything right off the bat, no matter what, 10% goes back into charity or back into tithing before we take anything out. So we all have active tithing accounts as well as a family charity account set up that another 10% goes into. So if a family member is sick or we got to support somebody or like we have a young mother with her baby that we're helping out right now. So I pay her rent and I pay her daycare for the baby. And that all comes out from an account that's very handy to have around if you just want to be able to take care of people, but that you'll forget to build unless you have that on set it and forget it mode. Um, and so Scott Ford with Way to Wealth has been a, a really good source of knowledge. Garrett Gunderson's book, Killing Sacred Cows, is really good. This idea of a family banking, which is also called like the Rockefeller approach to banking, is another thing that we do. And then um, my sons not only get to look over their PL statements for Go Greenfields every month, but they also get to look over my business's PL statements, learn where the cash is going where we're spending money, what employees and independent contractors they have. We we focus a great deal on hiring people to do things that free up the time for us to be better spent on what we're doing ourselves. And I mean, I, I actually had to take a look at their bank accounts last week to see, because because we're going very fair, you know, three ways straight up on this gaming company. And I mean, they've got, they're both 15 and they've got like $48,000 in savings each just sitting in the, That's great. the bank that they're able to put to work for them now. Not that we want it sitting in the bank for a while, but we're putting that to work for their first company that they're building. And then they're also in the process of starting their first nonprofit organization, which they want to go towards animal shelters. That's awesome. Animal adoption. That's, how did you find, so, how did you find, um, uh, that's interesting. You're supporting a young mother and her child with daycare and rent. How did that, how yeah, did that start? My wife, a couple of times a week, she works at this place called Life Center where they take moms that would normally be in a financial scenario in which they would be likely to need to abort their babies. And they instead 
set them up with homes for their babies, set them up with support, set them up with food, set them up with everything they need to ideally be able to have that baby go up for adoption or be able to have that baby themselves and be able to take care of it. As a part of that program, they're constantly looking for homes for these mothers. And so we opened up our home last year and this gal lived in our basement with her son for about seven months. And then now that she's left, you know, I've got her set up an apartment. I helped her get a job, um, helped her uh, apply for a business that she's building, like this special like bra company for moms and then set up daycare for her son. But it's because my wife volunteers at this local facility called Life Center. Wow, that's really nice. Yeah, that's that's going to be so fulfilling. Yeah. yeah. So when yeah. she was living with you, was she a kind of a part of the family stuff too, or she do her own thing? Well, she was a part of the family and I did not like that because mm. like, at least like the, whatever, the selfish, sinful part of me didn't like it because it really was like in my domain. Sure. You know, I had to like restructure family dinners. I, for some reason, had like this story that I'd tell myself for this cognitive resistance towards having sex when somebody else was in the basement, even though they were like far away down there. I was <laughs> oh, like, interesting. I don't like having sex when somebody else is in the house. And so we yeah. had to get over all of that. Like there were all these like barriers I had to get through. So it was, I mean, obviously if there wasn't some kind of sacrifice or discomfort associated with charity or with helping other people out, it really wouldn't be as meaningful. I don't think. Right. But yeah, it was tough for me, especially like wanting to gather my family for family dinner and play family games. And there's this mom and she doesn't know half the games we play and oh, we got to take an extra 20 minutes. Got teacher teacher. Now her baby's crying. And <laughs> yeah, like, like, yeah, it, it was hard on me, especially because probably of any person in the house, I'm the greatest like creature of habit. You know, I'd go to bed at like 945 or whatever because I'm an old fuddy-duddy and my wife's down there talking with her and helping her get her baby ready. And, you know, my wife finally comes up to bed at like 1030 and I'm like, hey, but I've been waiting up here for like 45 <laughs> minutes. So, yeah, so I was probably the worst just just getting used to it. So, so do you, yeah. okay, do you have, I love, love this. Do you have the self-awareness while it's ha happening or is this kind of like you reflecting back on everything like that? Or do you like recognize? Oh, it's, it, it, for me, it, you know, it got to the point where things were smooth and I figured everything out and I was like, oh, I can take my wife on date nights. And then we go up the separate driveway and we sneak into the guest house to have sex. So like I, <laughs> I just restructured everything, but yeah, I mean, for me, it wasn't, this all happened happening to me at the end of the road, realizing it all. It's just like all these micro adjustments you have to make, sure. even doing something as simple as like having somebody live in your home yeah. or in, in your extra room. Oh, that's a whatever. big deal. Like, yeah. You just don't think about mm -hmm. a lot. I of mean, you're, things. you're, you're a spiritual person. Do you feel that there was a specific message or lesson that you were being taught? Oh, selflessness, mm -hmm. you know, sacrifice, knowing that my tidy little routines, like all the <laughs> way down to like, I can't go out downstairs and jump on my mini trampoline in front of the infrared light when I get up because it's right next to her bedroom and the squeaking <laughs> will wake the baby. And like, yeah, you know, it's just yeah. little stupid things. Like when you step back and look at it in retrospect, but you get stuck with your, you guys know this, especially like, I think that, that guys who are like, 35, 40 years old who wait a long time in life to get married women too, I guess you get set in your ways and your yeah. habits and your weird rituals and routines. And you become more and more unmarriable <laughs> as time <laughs> yeah. progresses. Yeah. Like it's, it's like that stuck in old bachelor mode type of scenario, just cause yeah, we build our habits and it, you know, it, it gets messy when we get ripped out of those routines, but it's one of the best things for you for that to happen. That's cool. That's really nice, man. That's, yeah, that's yeah. awesome here. Did you, did you, uh, it would have been, I think what when I'm thinking about that, that would have been hard for me, the whole like discomfort of having a stranger. Yeah. yeah. Then the, what would have been hard for me would have been uh, potentially bonding with a baby that I'm not going to watch yeah. grow up. That was like, a weird thing too. It's like, I'm paying for daycare and feeding this kid. Like they're not going to have my last name. You know, you like this yeah. weird primal instinct. Like this is not, <laughs> not Grox. <laughs> but now, I mean like, yeah, like last Sunday was his second birthday party and we had him over and we sang birthday and you know, this That's mom, nice, she man. grew up poor and she never had birthday parties. And the, like, he's got, I don't even know what a godfather is, but it feels like we're almost like his god family now. And yeah. it's like this kid that we can take care of that hopefully is going to grow up to be a better person and be able to be influenced in a positive way by us and in a far, far more meaningful and personable way than just like an average kid who might come over and play with my sons or whatever. So, yeah, it is kind of cool in ways that I hadn't anticipated. Boy, that's a big deal yeah. because giving money is one thing but actually doing yeah. and being a part of like, that's a much bigger deal. Cause a lot of people, especially people with money can just be like, throw money at an issue. Oh, I feel better now. 
but to actually yeah. be a part of it and have to like, yeah, well, what, that's you know, a big deal. The irony of that is actually there's a, uh, they say there's a lot of like selfishness, believe it or not, in doing things like that, because that is it's, it makes you you makes your ego feel better because you're like, yeah. oh, I give. But you really don't want to give. Right. You know, you're not really sacrificing anything. <clears throat> What's one hundred thousand dollars to you when you make hundreds of millions of dollars? And so it's like you're actually really not sure. doing that is actually really challenging. Your, it's it's way different. It's the difference between volunteering in the local community or like, you know, around Christmas time, we'll go out and, you know, go shopping at Walmart for all the tools that are on the list for the local folks that gather everything together for the people that they're going to give it to on Christmas. And then we go there and we deliver it all and we package it up and we put it in bags or at Ben Greenfield life. Like we have this whole giving initiative where we'll like gather at team parties or team retreats and stuff bags or put things together for people. And yeah, it's way different than me just writing the check. So because you've done so many charitable things and you guys tithe and you do all those things, would you say that it was not only the hardest and probably most challenging for you, but also the most fulfilling? Like having a family live yeah, with yeah. us. Yeah, it, it's up there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's up there. Mm -hmm. um, my wife and I, for a couple of years, toyed around with the idea of adopting a baby. Mm -hmm. And it, we didn't wind up doing it, A, because of this farm and home move that's been taking up so much time. We didn't feel like we'd be able to, to give as much time as needed to a baby. And B, because... Apparently, like the thing now with adoption is open adoption where the mom gets to come over and visit on a weekly yeah. or a monthly basis and she has full access to the family. I felt like we were adopting like an entire family versus just a baby. And to me, that something about that seemed a little bit weird, especially if this was going to be our baby. Right. But the idea of just taking care of other people and their babies seemed actually at the end of the day, like way more fulfilling and just as meaningful to us as adopting a baby. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And, and, and apparently these type of organizations exist in a lot of communities. So, I mean, like if somebody's listening in or whatever, like you can actually find moms who are looking for a place to stay and usually it's temporary and they come over to your home and they do a big interview with you to make sure you're not, you know, weird people who inject peptides and stick laser lights up your nose. <laughs> and that baby's actually going to be safe there. And then, yeah. And then you pass the interview. Well, and, and, that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait, are you the, yeah. are you the guy that wrote the article about, yeah, Injecting exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, that, hopefully that one yeah. didn't come up. <laughs> did you find, did you find, um, your spirituality during that crisis eight or nine years ago? Was that when it really started to take hold? I was born into a pretty like strict conservative Christian family. You know, right. I grew but up did as you, like a Sunday you, school kid going to church every week, memorizing the Bible. But I never had like this deep spiritual knowing of God. It wasn't like, when we first met you, you didn't have this wasn't a big part of your life. And I would say when you guys first met me, I was probably just getting to the stage where okay. business was not becoming the pedestal. Yeah, because he said eight, nine years ago. We started right. this thing nine, yeah. nine years ago. So. Yeah. And it, it what happened <clears throat> was that crisis drove me to the point of realizing everything that I'd read and had the head knowledge about, oh, you're supposed to pray in the morning. And the Bible has a whole bunch of really great wisdom in it that you should steep yourself in if you really want to be close to God and be able to fully love other people. Or, you know, no Bible, no breakfast, no Bible, no bed, you know, pray before breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Have times when you're going off and fasting and engaging in deeper periods of prayer. Have times when you're meditating, you know, pray yourself to sleep at night, bring the family together and and dwell upon the importance of and prioritize spirituality within. Like all of those were things that I began to do when I realized that my life had kind of gone to crap spiritually. And now, I mean, like it's, it's absolutely amazing. You know, I have my own personal prayer that I've written and that I can recite each morning, you know, while I'm on my knees and we have those morning devotion times and I do a lot of breath work, but now I yoke it to scripture meditation, like uh, on all three walls of the sauna. I've always got a new section of scripture that I'm memorizing every time that I get into the sauna. And I'm actually working with a new app right now called the breath source because I found that a lot of these breathwork apps are kind of like new age and woo woo and self affirmations and, you know, finding the lights behind the third eye in your head or whatever. But I'm like, if I'm doing breath work, why not use that as a time to pray? You know, a lot of these early desert uh, church fathers and mothers would have like the Jesus prayer where you'd breathe in and you say, Oh Lord, Jesus Christ, son of God, and breathe out. You say, have mercy on me, a sinner, or, you know, you're dwelling upon like, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death and you breathe out, you're with me. 
And so now I'm recording all these different breath work and prayer sessions all the way to the point where if you guys ever done like Wim Hof, like mm-hmm. the, where we're at. So I've got a couple that are like six, seven rounds of Wim Hof, but every time you're on those long exhales and long inhales, you got my voice booming in your head with a new verse. Like I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And you're holding that inhale and that exhale. And so by the time you finish, you've had this whole spiritual session along with your breath work session. So my intention now is I just weave this knowing of God and connection to God into as many aspects of my day as possible. And yeah, eight or nine years ago, that would have, I would have been like, yeah, we I pray before meals. If I remember, and I read my Bible occasionally and sometimes go to church. When I it's asked like, Bishop Barron, he's a Catholic Bishop about all the movements and, you know, kneel, stand, sit, st- he says you involve the body yeah. with it all. And so that's kind of what you're talking about a little bit is you're involving the body with the, with this prayer. And it makes a lot of sense, even if you're not religious, just from a meditative standpoint, when you look at the studies on meditation, like involving the body with, with what you're trying to do makes a big difference. In the same way that I indicated earlier, like I think that we were like created to create, we were designed to create. And, you know, as a Christian creationist, I think that the, the world was created by God and God made us in his image. And part of being made in his image is we have this deep inner craving to create. Well, at the same time, if you look at the positioning of our hands and the stomping of our feet and our ability to make instruments and our vocal cords and the fact that the universe was literally designed in such a fashion that it that very efficiently transmits sound and sound waves indicates that we were not only made to create, but we were made to worship. We were made to make songs. We were made to listen to music. We were made to like sing to God. We were made to like move our bodies and clap our hands and stomp our feet and dance and sway in a way that's almost like worship. Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I think that that's like a core part of being a human being is, you know, Paul check says something like, you know, people, a lot of people forget to dance and sing and dream. And I think that if you've lost a lot of your spiritual walk with God, it's a lot easier to forget to dance and sing and dream. And then once you start dancing and singing and dreaming for God, it's like, oh, this is filling like this eternal hole in my soul. Right. It's so amazing. Uh, one other thing that you've really changed your, your mind on since we've met you was your your, how you felt about, uh, psychedelic use and plant medicines. And it seems like you, you started in one place and you ended somewhere else with, you know, what their value is or what their potential dangers are or how you should use them. Can you walk us through that journey a little bit? Yeah. I I think that plant medicines are, they have incredible utility and they're, they're on this planet for a purpose. And there, there's a great deal of benefit that can be derived from the use of them for something like um, unlocking past traumas or simulative end of life therapy for somebody with cancer um, or in smaller doses for creativity, for, for empathy, for focus. I mean, microdosing with things like psilocybin or, or LSA or Wachuma, like I think in smaller amounts in the same way that like, you know, the book of Proverbs in the Bible, you know, use, use honey as an example, like too much makes you sick and makes you vomit, but a little bit sweetens up a lot. And I think you could say the same for plant medicines. And then there's certain far fewer than I think people, people think, but there's certain use cases for plant medicines in larger doses. They're also very dangerous because traditionally plant medicines have been the way in which human beings cross a spiritual portal into this fourth dimension that I think goes far beyond just tweaking of neurotransmitters or a dump of DMT or special images that you see in your brain when you downregulate the default mode network. I mean, when people talk about entities and they talk about visions and they talk about voices and they talk about these deeply spiritual experiences all the way down to the point where, you know, most atheists who have done plant medicine after they've done it, they say, oh, I do believe that there is a spiritual world. I do believe that there is a God. Well, the fact that these are the portals into another world, into another spiritual dimension, means that you're kind of in a a dangerous place when you're entering into a world where, yeah, you've got God and angels and Jesus and light and all the amazingly positive things that I experienced, you know, experimenting with just about every form of plant medicine that exists for, for years, probably like half a dozen years. But the problem is there's also demons, there's, you know, there's, there's Satan, there, there's all sorts of other weird entities that you experience. And for every nine people that have an amazing experience with plant medicine, there's like one person who winds up with might be classified in, you know, the DSM manual is 
a psychiatric disorder like bipolar or schizophrenia or something like that, but that I believe is some form of an entity possession. Because who are we to think that, you know, by, you know, being in the right set and setting or doing the right work beforehand or having the right intention going in that by us crossing into a spiritual portal, we are going to be just fine interacting with spiritual entities that have basically been effing around with humans for like the past 10,000 plus years in those same dimensions. I mean, most of these things that people are journeying with plant medicines with to find themselves have traditionally been used for witchcraft, for divination, for calling up ghosts, for interacting with demons and, and all these things that kind of have a, a dark, sordid history behind them. Now, if you look at the word pharmakia in the Bible, and this is where for me as a Christian, I, I really had that moment where I was like, oh, th there's great benefit in these things, but- You I wrote have, articles like, about this. Yeah. Yeah, so I read Like pharmakia means divining with the gods via the use of plants and drugs. Like specific, that is something that's even set apart from alcoholism. Like alcoholism is lack of sobriety or temperance, whereas pharmakia is using drugs to go into a spiritual portal and say, oh, what would you have for me to do? Or what do I need to see now? Or what's the next step in my life? And it can be a really dangerous place, especially for someone who is susceptible to influence spiritually or, and you know, by saving grace, I think that if you're a Christian in those portals, you're a lot of times protected because you've got the the good spirits on your side. Like spiritual armor. Yeah. But then at the same time, like, but the Bible, and I claim to be a Christian, the Bible says you're not supposed to use drugs and plant medicines to divine with the spiritual realm. So I've kind of got no choice here. It's like God said not to do it. And I said, I believe in God and I'll follow his law. And upon my studying of the Bible, it refers to pharmakia as that. So I still have psilocybin and LSD and Wachuma and DMT capsules and all sorts of stuff around the house. Um, it's in a far more protected place than it used to be in a far less convenient place because I know that in high doses or if my sons were to take some in high doses or something that like that, you're crossing into a spiritual portal. And so I only use that kind of stuff now for the purposes of microdosing. I think that there's a possibility that it could be used for end of life therapy or for down regulating the default mode network to the point where you can deal with trauma and things like that. But even that I'm beginning to change my stance on because a lot of these synthetic variants that don't seem to carry with them the same type of unpredictability mm -hmm. and post use issues in some people with things like schizophrenia and bipolar, like some of the new psilocybin analogs or ketamine, for example, these, these synthetic analogs seem far more predictable, far more precise, faster onset, uh, lower time in the system. And I've never had a bad experience or anything I would classify as like spiritual with those type of compounds. I feel like those are more, um, like even here in San Jose, you can do ketamine therapy legally. Yeah. And it's a low dose. It's yeah. not the dose that people are doing when they're getting all messed yeah, up. Yeah, you're not k hold No. Yeah. And so they'll take a little low dose and then they'll do therapy along with it and journaling. And I could see, right. and, the, and the, the data on PTSD and processing trauma seems to point in that direction with the lower doses alongside therapy, just enough to get you to be able to look at your trauma. I oh think yeah. I mean, okay. my wife and I will sometimes do breath work before sex and we'll sometimes do like a snort of ketamine or oxytocin to slightly downregulate the default mode network mm -hmm. and get into a deeper space for sex. Or, you know, I've used uh, like half a trochee of ketamine before during a long plane flight to lull myself off to sleep or during a massage to melt my body a little bit. Like there's use cases for a lot of this stuff. But I think that the fact that when we look at a lot of these traditional plant medicines or fungal derivatives like LSD and their use in previous history, everything from, you know, like, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, when you're traveling across different portals, not distance healing, astral. but um, yeah, astral travel yeah. that that's used by witches or a lot of the shamanic ceremonies with some of these other drugs, like their, their purpose in many cases is to divine with the spiritual world, which I think is a, a dangerous thing mm -hmm. to be doing. And I think that also you have to take into account the interests of the person who is administering or serving these medicines. And I've talked to many people who have worked with shamans who, for example, have them under their possession almost, like going back for their 38th ayahuasca trip yeah. from a commercial standpoint because they've saved hair or skin from this person. They have the ability to be able to almost like possess them as a human. And so there's oh. there's all sorts of weird, weird things that like it's a dangerous world. I, I think that my only real 
acceptance for the use of something like higher dose psilocybin or LSD or Wachuma or ayahuasca or something like that would be in a very tightly controlled set and setting by someone who was demonstrated to be extremely mental stable, m- mentally stable with someone who is extremely trustworthy in that room. And you treat it almost like a surgery and not like a ayahuasca yeah. vacation to Peru with some shaman whose lineage you might be unfamiliar with in a set and setting where you're getting exposed to spiritual entities that may not have your best interest in mind. Yeah, I would agree with you 100%. I think anything with that much power, you got, there's double edged. Yeah. And, yeah. It, and, and look, the da- I'm like all in the, to the data on how they're treating trauma with some of these things. And they're not using these crazy, ridiculous <clears throat> doses that people are doing on their own. They're just not. And yeah. And it's along with the therapist. Yeah. And I used to, um, I forget if you guys have, have had a conversation with me about this or not, but I used to sometimes use that stuff for like business breakthroughs right. and mm-hmm. like, cause you just think in different ways. Sure. But I found that when you combine microdosing with breath work, you can breathe yourself into that same state. Like I can take a microdose of psilocybin, do an hour of holotropic breath work, sit with the journal for the half hour after that and have my mind open to creativity in the very same way yeah. as if I'd taken like a heroic dose of psilocybin and been flat on my ass for eight hours, you know, speaking into a voice recorder or whatever. Yeah. You could get that, you could get that experience from fasting. You could yeah. get that experience from being with people who spark that creativity. Um, I experienced that with these guys. Yeah. Um, when we create workout programs, like there was a couple times, you know, one program in particular, I remember we really got creative, but it was sparked through just working together. Yeah. Um, and historically, that's how people have, uh, you know, have done it. So, no, good stuff, man. You're always fun to talk to. Yeah. Man. I appreciate yeah, your honesty, too. Yeah. Very open and honest every time. We yeah, talk it was to fun. You. So what are we going to do if there's peptides or LSD? Huh? <laughs> 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 do they have a pe- an LSD peptide? <laughs> yeah, hey, well, I, I actually, the last things I know we got we to gotta finish. I, I don't think I put it out yet, but I was talking to a guy who does all sorts of mushroom growths on different mediums. Like he's planting like reishi mushrooms on turmeric and the mushroom actually oh, cool. harvests the turmerosaccharides from the turmeric root that it's grown on, oh, concentrates those in the fruiting body of the mushroom. He'll then powder that and have like a reishi turmeric mushroom extract, or he'll do something like chaga on ginger and have like an immune supporting compound that Wild. supports the well, gut. Mushrooms by having, suck up whatever they're on top yeah, of. By having, yeah. yeah, but I didn't realize. I always thought mushrooms you grow on oat or rye or wood poop. or whatever. <laughs> then you just harvest the mushroom, yeah, or poop. But um, he even mentioned how he's doing like a psilocybin growth on cannabis where you have like a <laughs> THC infused psilocybin. So oh, wow. it's crazy stuff with mushrooms. So yeah. Cool it's stuff. total aside, but interesting. Right. No, yeah. no discount code. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not, not aware of. Yeah. Try Ben 10. And if that doesn't work, then we'll use we'll AI to your fix bag the later. code later on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Ben, thanks. Thanks for coming back. Yeah, thanks, always, always yeah, a pleasure. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of weak points and and areas that I struggled with developing for a a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 